Greetings, everyone, and welcome to New Life Community Church weekend worship service. We're glad that you've tuned in. Just greetings to all of our church family. We sure miss you. I miss you. My staff team here misses you. I'm so thankful for them, just all the work they've done to put these services together every weekend. Katie, Shauna, and Karina, they're all just doing their part to make this happen for you, but it's just not the same. I get it, and you get it, and we can't wait to be together again in the future. But in the meantime, we're happy and we're glad and we're thankful to God that we can provide this for you. And if you're in the community and watching this, not part of our church family, but just like, hey, this is a good time to check out church, we welcome you. You're totally welcome here. We'd love to hear from you. So just get, send us a, an email, uh, call us, fill in the online form on the website. We'd love to hear from you. If you're from outside of our region, from other parts of the provinces and country in which we live, just greetings to you. Hey, Mom, glad you're here. And uh, we just want to look at God's Word this morning as we come together to learn in the midst of this whole COVID-19 situation. So would you pray with me as we come to God's Word together? Our Father in heaven, we thank you just that you are the God over all, that we can trust in you even in uncertain and difficult situations. And today as we come to God's Word, give us a focus on Jesus. Help us to, to get away from our problems and our struggles and the anxiety that has riddled us throughout the week and just help us to to have a fresh vision of Jesus as we look at this passage in John chapter 11. And may you be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every day, maybe you're like me, you turn on the radio, go online, or maybe turn on the TV, and you, you see the latest report. What's been happening? How many people have the virus? How many people have succumbed to the virus or have died from the virus? How many have recovered from the virus? And, and this is sort of a number that we're all watching because we're, we're hoping that at some point those numbers stop increasing and begin to, to decrease or the number of, of survival or people that have gone through it you know, increases and the number of deaths decrease. And we live in this kind of life and death situation right now. And it's interesting that as we come to God's Word this morning, we encounter a passage that deals with the questions of life and death and addresses it in a real direct way manner through a story of three friends of Jesus and, how, and their journey with death and how Jesus met them in their journey with death. And so I invite you to join us as we journey today into John 11 and we learn more about who Jesus is as he encounters a situation that would be similar to situations that you and I will face in our own life journey. And how Jesus brings a response to that situation. You see, what we'll find in this text is that there's a problem and that there's a solution. And that between the problem and the solution, there is an equation. There's a formula. And the key to that formula, that to get to the solution, you have to have the right formula. You have to have the right equation. And in John 11, the Apostle John paints a portrait of Jesus Christ to show how he is the solution and he's a key part of that formula to discovering the solution when it comes to the matter of death. So if you have your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, again, you can email us. We're happy to send you one. It's also, hopefully, will be up so you can kind of follow along. But in John 11, the Apostle John, the firsthand eyewitness of Jesus Christ, writes in his gospel this story of Lazarus, of Martha, and of Mary. Follow along. It says in John 11, verse 1, thus, Now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village where Mary and her sister Martha lived. Now it was Mary who anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now you have to understand, um, this is similar to the situation we're living in today. Lazarus is really sick. It's not like he's got a cold or just a, a small sore throat or a little sniffles. He is in palliative care. He is in the ICU of its day. The vital signs are, are decreasing with every second of the clock or, or every passing shadow of the sun. And, and, and they're getting, getting to get antsy about this. And they said, Jesus, our brother's sick. The one you love is sick. And we'll, and we'll find in this passage that Jesus had this close connection with this family. And so it would be natural for us to assume that Jesus would jump up and run to help them as quickly as he could. Jesus responds, of course, to the request in verse 4. And he says, obviously, to his disciples. He's not with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus at this time. He's away from them. When Jesus heard this, he said, The sickness 
This sickness will not lead to death, but to God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So he says, this is the solution. The solution is this, that it's not going to lead to death, but to God's glory, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. You see, God brought this circumstance into their life so that John could record it for posterity and forever and ever as an example of how Jesus can meet us even in our situations of of deepest and direst need. That he's going to bring glory out of the situation that they find themselves in. Just like Jesus and God will bring glory to the situation that we find ourselves in today. Despite the confusion of it, the uncertainty of it, the anxiety that comes with it, we can count on God to fulfill his plan and his purposes even in the midst of our difficult, trying situations that we find ourselves in today. He, he's aware of your situation. And he said, this will be for my ultimate glory. But what we find in verse 6 is really interesting. It says in verse 6, so when, Je- when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he remained in the place where he was for two more days. I mean, the natural response that we would think would be logical for Jesus. For a family that he loved, that he was close with, that he would begin to to head over there, or like he did in other situations uh, with the centurion when when he was told about his his servant that was sick, Jesus said, look, it's been done, he's okay, he's healed. You know, Jesus could heal from a distance, but in this situation, Jesus doesn't go anywhere. He remains intentionally where he is for two more days. Sometimes God does that to us. I don't know, maybe you've had that experience where you needed God's help and you called out for God's help and then God didn't help as quickly as you thought he should or the way he should. And, and you found yourself disappointed and we're going to see that in a moment. But, but Jesus sits still and says, look, there's a timetable that Jesus is on that, that is aligned with his Father's will. And he's keen to do whatever God the Father wants him to do in that moment. And in that moment, God the Father was like, just take it easy, Jesus. Rest where you are. I got this figured out, and we'll figure this out. But for the humans, for the rest of the people on the earth dealing with this problem, it makes no sense. Maybe you feel that way. It makes no sense the way God is dealing with this situation of COVID-19. It doesn't make any sense why all these jobs would be lost why all these people would get sick. It doesn't make sense why my circumstance, my kids are at home and and this is messing up their grade 12 year, their graduation year. It doesn't make sense. I've had to cancel this event and that event. It doesn't make sense. But God has a bigger plan in place. And after this, it says in verse 7, Jesus says to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples replied, Rabbi, the Jewish leaders were just trying to stone you to death. Are you going there again? I mean, they had left Judea. It was a kind of a hotbed of activity. And, and, and the disciples were like, are you sure it's kind of dangerous to go there, Jesus? And Jesus replied in verse 9, are there not 12 hours in a day? He's using kind of a Hebraic expression. They kind of viewed the day in two, two you know, uh, slots. There was the daytime and the nighttime. And in metaphorically speaking, Jesus saying the daytime is when you do the Lord's will. It's following, it's God's time. He's like, you know, are there not 12 hours? Day? Has God, I, I'm following my Father's will, and, and when my time is up, my time is up, but I trust His timetable in this situation. If anyone walks around in the daytime, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks around at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And he's like, basically, when you're doing God's will, you can trust that you're doing the right thing. You have that confidence that you're walking in the daylight hours. The disciples don't understand. They're, they're just thinking about the, the earthly risk. But Jesus is like, look, my father, you know, I'm, I'm on his timetable and, and we need to go back there because he's about to do something. We're about to do something really significant here. And after this, he says to them, he adds to them for the disciples' sake, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. And the disciples replied, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now they're thinking, you know, he's just sick or he's in some kind of a a coma that he'll come out of the coma. And and Jesus like, you guys just don't get this, do you? And he says to them in verse 14, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And I'm glad for your sake 
that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Look, 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 guys, I, I'm telling you, he's dead. Now, of course, how did Jesus know this? He received a messenger a couple days before saying Lazarus was sick. The messenger had gone back. There pro- we don't receive any notification that there had been any more communication, but Jesus knows that he's dead. Interesting, isn't it? You think the disciples say, well, how did Jesus know that Lazarus is dead? But, but they don't really get it because even verse you know, 16, Thomas replies, he says, yes. Thomas said to his fellow disciples, let us go too so that we may die with him. And he thinks maybe this is some kind of a spiritual journey and some kind of martyrdom. Who knows what he's thinking, you know, but, but Jesus is like, no, I'm dealing with the physical death situation here. I'm dealing with an impossible situation. Now, Jesus had dealt with a lot of difficult circumstances. He had been brought some really troubled cases in the past. He encountered men possessed by multiple demons whom he just rebuked and they're gone. He's encountered, you know, angry, hungry crowds on a, on, a, on a remote hillside and he fed them all with limited resources. He's calmed raging, you know, storms on the Sea of Galilee. He's healed blind people, you know, given, you know, uh, helped mute people to speak. He's, he's raised paralyzed people. I mean, He's encountered a lot of difficult situations, but this seems to be the impossible situation for Jesus to encounter. You see, because what we find in verse 17, that when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days already. Now, this is important. You see, the Jewish understanding of resurrection was that, you know, for three days after death, there was the possibility that you could come back. They had this kind of mythological, mystical view of, of death and resurrection that there was still a possibility, but, but once those three days period had passed, the fourth day, you were gone. Your, your body was now, under, un, you know, it was, it was already beginning the process of decay and, and was past recognition, and, and your hope for, for resuscitation or resurrection was gone at that point. Jesus arrives four days later. It's the middle of the morning period says in verse 18, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. So many of the Jewish people of that region had come to Martha and Mary to console them over the loss of their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. I mean, this, this is, of course, it sounds like she's blaming Jesus. She's not blaming Jesus. It's more of like a, a sigh of like, Oh, Jesus, if just you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. She's in the middle of the grieving period. Now, understand, this is how it works. In this period of time, when someone died, you quickly got them into the ground. Because it's warm, it's a tempered climate, you, you, you know, the body begins to decay quickly. So they would bury the person quite quickly, and then the mourning period will occur after that for at least a week. People would come in, professional mourners were hired, there was wailing and music, and you would sometimes visit the graveside or not, but you know, this is kind of what happened, and she's right in the middle of the week. I mean, this is the lowest point of the low. Now, I'm, I'm speaking now about death. This is a serious topic, and those of you that have journeyed the, the, the valley of death, and, and this means losing someone that's really close to you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, the the first day of when a person dies, there's the immediate shock. Uh, the second day is kind of the unbelief and then that sort of an act aftershock. And then the third and the fourth day, you just begin to feel the, the incredible weight of the loss. She's at about the lowest point of grief. I mean, and grief kind of comes like, 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 a, like an ocean. It sort of waves over you, it splashes over you back and forth, and the, the tide rises and goes down. I mean, this is the way grief operates. Many of you understand what I'm talking about. Martha's right in the middle of that week of grieving. People have been around. They've gone through the whole burial process. I mean, it's just like, and she's like, oh, Jesus, if just you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But even now, Verse 22, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will grant you. I mean, I don't know how you're going to handle the situation, Jesus, but I know you could do something here. And maybe she's thinking you could help us with our grief. Maybe, I I don't know what even she's thinking, and I don't even know if she knows what she's thinking, but she's just saying, oh, we wouldn't have entered this journey had you been here, Jesus. Now, the interesting this, let me just stop for a second, because Mary's going to say the same thing. But just understand, this is the problem. Lazarus is sick, Lazarus is dead, and now we've got this grief, the problem. 
Part of the problem here for Martha, though, and for Mary, her sister, we'll find later too, is there's just a little mistaken theology here. Because they don't fully understand who Jesus is. This is what John wants to teach us in his gospel. Because if you really believe that Jesus is God, you would have a theology that, that the Bible teaches about God, that God is omnipresent. That means he, he, he's everywhere at once. He's not limited to physical locality. So if, if she really believed that Jesus was God, which she will affirm in just a moment, then to say that he wasn't there would be wrong. Now, of course, Jesus is God and man fused together in this unique union that's hard to explain. But Jesus was there. He knew what was going on. He knew Lazarus had died. He was fully aware of every part of their situation. He was fully acquainted with every part of grief and suffering that was included in this journey for Martha and for Mary. He knew, even though he wasn't physically in the room with them, he understood and we'll find was compassionate towards that. I mean, the fact that he comes back shows that he cares. He loves them. But ultimately, he's going to glorify God in this situation in a unique way. Jesus replies in verse 23 to her. He says, your brother will come back to life again. And again, this is a reference to what he's talked about in verse 4. This sickness will not lead to death, but to God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And Martha says, yeah, I know that he will come back to life again in the resurrection of the dead. Like, she remembers her Sunday school lessons. She remembers the teachings of Jesus. And he talked about the resurrection. There's going to be the resurrection to, to eternal life. She's like, yes, I know that he's got the resurrection promise. I get it, Jesus. And, and, and Jesus is talking about here and now. She's talking about way in the future. I mean, they're kind of on different wavelengths here. And Jesus looks at her and he gives this startling and significant statement in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I mean, this is a startling statement. She says, I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. He says, whoever believes in me will live even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. And he's talking about Two different experiences of life and death here, which are significant to John's gospel. Because as he presents to us a picture of Jesus Christ, a comprehensive picture of Christ, he wants you to understand that there is life in Jesus, but it's not just physical breathing life. It's not heart pulsing and, and you know, nerves racing. It's a deeper experience and a lasting experience of life. Jesus has come to restore the life that was lost when sin entered the world. And he is, in, he is facing death square in its eyes and saying, look, I have life that transcends even physical death here. I love preaching this at funerals because it is a promise that we can cling to. That even in the face of physical death, we can continue to experience life. Well, how is that possible? Well, it's because we are connected to the giver of life, Jesus Christ himself. He's like, look, I am the source of life. And this is, not, this is bigger than physical life. This is life that goes on forever and ever and ever. And I have the power over life and death. And you can trust me. So if you entrust your life into my hands, I will look after you. And even if physical death occurs in your life experience, and it will, I've got it taken care of. Now, I know in our modern worldview, postmodern, possibility of death sometimes seems like such a scary reality. Especially maybe if you didn't come up from a faith background. And maybe even if you did come up from a faith background, there's some weird ideas about death that, that even make it more scary, you know. And, and Jesus comes into that and he says, look, physical death is a reality because of sin in this world, but I have come to bring life and I am the resurrection of life. And even if you die physically, you continue to live because you know and are connected with me. We'll come back to this. He's like, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who comes into the world. She, she, she believes it, but she doesn't quite understand how this statement will impact the current situation that they are living in. She, this is a, a wonderful statement of faith in the Gospel of John. I mean, this is kind of what, this is an exemplary statement that John puts several of these in his Gospel just so you understand. What is the right response to Jesus? Here it is. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who comes into the world. Yes, yes, you are the solution. But I'm not sure how the 
how you fit into the equation to get from my problem to the solution. How do you help me, Jesus, here in this situation? And so it says in verse 28, we, Mary entered, comes into the, into the scene. And when she had said this, Martha went and called her sister Mary and saying privately, the teacher is here and is asking for you. So when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had come out to meet him. Then the people who were with Mary in the house consoling her saw her get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the people who had come with her weeping, he was intensely moved in spirit and greatly distressed. There's another story about Martha and Mary in the Gospels, not in this Gospel. It's a story where Jesus is teaching and Martha's working away and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha's like, look, Jesus, can you tell Martha to to Mary to give me a hand? And Jesus is like, look, you know, Mary's found the better thing. She's learning from me. And it's kind of, it puts Martha kind of in this negative light. And I'm glad that this story's in in the Gospels because it it puts Martha in better light and it kind of puts Mary in in a different light, not in a supremely negative light, but Mary's stuck in in the midst of the grief. All these mourners that have come from Jerusalem, this big crowd of people that has been wailing in the house, playing their flutes, these dreary songs on the flute, and, and, and just living in the moment of grief, are following her. There's probably this cacophony of sounds, and she encounters Jesus there, and, and all this is going on. And in verse 33, it tells us that Jesus was intensely moved in spirit and greatly distressed. It's hard to translate this verb. Our English translations tend to kind of lighten it, but it... In, in the Greek, it's almost it's the idea of a, a horse snorting. It's this kind of anger, and, and a healthy anger. It's this, this response of, of, I can't believe this is going on. Jesus is facing this reality of this, of this hopelessness of all the people around them. That death is the final frontier, and, and it's, it's the point of no return. It's, it's over. It's gone. The, you know, the, the Hebrew idea of Sheol was it's the place of the dead, this mournful, lonely, you know, shadowy kind of place. And, and there they all live, you know, live, you know, mourning this reality. And Jesus is standing there, the resurrection of life. And he just says, like, can you not, do you not realize who's with you? That we don't have to respond to physical death in this way. Because you have someone here who is greater than death. You have the resurrection and life standing right in front of you. He's irked at this. And Mary seems to be caught up in the emotion of the moment. Now, I understand. I get it. Grief and mourning is a journey of of emotional highs and lows. And it's healthy. And let me tell you, like, I've, you know, I've been in, you know, where where people are, are just, crying from their soul. Sometimes it happens at, at, at the, the casket. Sometimes it happens in the hospital room when the loved one passes away. I've seen it at the graveside when all of a sudden there's just this gush of emotion and this cry comes out of a person's vo- in a voice and you can just tell this, this is grief being expressed out loud. I mean, that, that, that's legitimate. But in this case, these were professional mourners. They're kind of playing the game. They're, they're moaning, they're wailing. Mary's kind of caught up in this, but she's like, oh, Jesus, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Not blaming Jesus, but just saying, oh, man, this is such a horrible journey, and it could have, you know, you could have prevented it. But she doesn't understand that there is a way through this journey. The, the very presence of Jesus right now is a piece of that puzzle. That Jesus wants to meet them in this journey. And so he says to them, in verse 34, where have you laid him? And they replied, Lord, come and see. And it says, Jesus wept, verse 35. One of the, you know, we used to love 1135 because if it came time to memorize a verse, that was the shortest verse to memorize. But it's a significant verse. Just think about that. Jesus wept. Apostle John wants you and I to know that Jesus was fully human. That he had emotion. And the word for weeping is different than the word for mourning earlier. This is not that wailing and screaming and trilling. This is is just heartfelt sympathy for the moment. Now, but oddly enough, Jesus knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. So he's not crying for his friend Lazarus, I don't think, in this moment. He is weeping over the reality that he lives and he's walking around in a sinful universe where the, the reality of sin is so poignantly 
you know, visible at the graveside when you see that the wages of sin is death. Everyone dies, and, and we all live in this, in this journey where we try to forget that reality or not think about that reality, but then we're all faced up to it at some point or another in life. And Jesus weeps thinking, if only they knew who was here. And he understands that, that he himself, in a short little while, will also be living this experience of Lazarus. Jesus knows John 12, the the gospel turns the corner and he's heading towards Jerusalem. He's heading towards the cross. He's weeping because he knows what he's about to face too in his own life. That he's about to face for you and for me. The cross. Jesus wept. It's funny because the people in verse 36, the people who had come to mourn said, look how much he loved him. I mean, they see it. Jesus is not this detached deity that doesn't identify with us. He totally understands our situation. And that's good news for you today. He gets where you're at. He understands the journey you're on in life. He understands the grief that you're facing. He understands the anxiety, the worries, the problems that that are building up around your life. He gets it. And he's sympathetic towards it. But they said, in verse 37, but some of them said, this is the man who caused the blind man to see couldn't he have done something to keep Lazarus from dying? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, they're kind of they're sort of making fun of Jesus. Oh, he's so compassionate, but, but is he going to do anything? I mean, he is going to do something. But this is the thing. It's like we think or we confine God to a certain point of action, and God says, I've got this taken care of, but I'm going to do it my way. And that's where faith and trust in Jesus comes into play. Because it's not always your way or my way. It's God's way. And he handles our situations in his own timing and in his own way for his ultimate glory. You and I need to trust in God through these situations. And so in verse 38 it says, Jesus intensely moved again, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was placed across it. Maybe you've seen a picture of a tomb like this. and You know, it's a rock thrown out and there's, there's sort of a, a cavity there where they would lie the body and then there's usually shelves inside there where after a year the body would you know the, the the body would decompose on this on this bench of sorts and then they would take a year later they would take all the bones put them into an ossuary and put those bones up on a shelf and uh, all the family bodies were there in the tomb and and jesus comes to this tomb it's been sealed it's been rolled across because his body now is in is in active decay the corpse is doing what what dead corpses do and jesus shows up And Jesus says in verse 39, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, replied, Lord, by this time the body will have a bad smell because he's been buried for four days. I mean, Martha is the pragmatist. She's the practical one in the family. She's like, look, Jesus, we got a problem here. It's going to stink. Like, literally, that's, it's as blunt as that in the text. I mean, this is not a good idea, Jesus. It's going to stink. I mean, I don't know what she expected Jesus to do, but he's like, look, I'm taking care of this. Yes, in its natural course of events, that is the reality, but I am encountering this situation as the Son of God, as the resurrection and the life. He says in verse 40, Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have listened to me. I knew that you always listened to me, but I said this for the sake of the crowd standing around here, that they may believe that you sent me. I mean, he's saying this prayer not for the benefit of of him and his father, but just for the crowd that's there because they're all like, what is going on here? We've got a dead man, decaying in a tomb. We've got Jesus who's saying, roll that stone away. Now, interesting, he invites them to be a part of this. He could have just said, okay, come out, and the stone would have blasted away, but he's like, no, I want you to be a part of this with me. I want you to to have some hands-on in this situation. Yes, roll away that stone. And then Jesus said, verse 43, when he had said this, he shouted out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. (laughs) Lazarus, come out. Now, some of the commentators said, if he wouldn't have identified Lazarus, there's a possibility that all of the people in that tomb would have come out at once. (laughs) So he identifies the one guy in the tomb that's allowed to come out in that moment. I mean, it's kind of an interesting thought. But then the one who had died came out. His feet and hands tied up with strips of cloth and a cloth wrapped around his face. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. Like, can you believe it? 
Never had they seen anything like this. It says in verse 45, Then many of the people who had come with Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Jesus looks death straight in the face and commands it down so that Lazarus can live. He says, look, Lazarus, come on. And Lazarus comes down and he lives. Now understand, Lazarus would go on to die later. But when Jesus died on the cross and they buried him in a tomb, and he rose again on his own power three days later. He continues to live to this day. And when you and when I believe in Jesus Christ, when we place our faith in him, we have the promise that we too will live just as Jesus lives, with an immortal, indestructible body that lasts forever and ever. Amen. And in the final kingdom, understand, we're all heading in that direction if we believe in Jesus Christ. We'll look back on this tiny 70, 60, 50, 80, 90 year, whatever many years God gives us, period of our life as such a small piece of our whole existence. Jesus says, I'm coming to bring you life, to restore the life that was lost when sin entered the world. I'm coming to bring you life that goes on forever and ever. You can trust in me as the resurrection life. Even if you die, you will live. Whoever lives and believes will never die. He's like, the reality is there's this idea of the second death, which is the ultimate removal from God's presence forever and ever and ever. And Jesus is like, I don't, that's not my will. My will is that you would come and live with me and my Father forever in heaven, forever and ever. And look, I can handle death. It has no power over me. He proves it here and he proves it when he rises from the dead. We find at the end of the Gospel of John. So as we navigate this difficult, strange season, full of fear and anxiety and uncertainty and even the possibility of death, the Gospel of John and Jesus himself tells us not to worry but that the solution to the, the problem that everyone in the world faces is found in one person, Jesus Christ. That when he's part of your equation, you have the guaranteed solution. That you can trust in Jesus today and have this hope and this assurance, even in the uncertainty and the times in which we live. I mean, there are situations where we just don't know why things happen the way they do. I was thinking this this week. As it's supposed to be spring, but here in Lloydminster, it's minus 20 and, you know, two feet of snow outside. <laughs> We're like, where is spring? Who knows? It's coming. Lord, help it to come soon. But I was thinking about soccer season because that's usually what we would be doing in the, in the spring as a family. And we ran a little soccer league down in Airdrie a few years ago, and there was one lady that volunteered to help. And she volunteered one year to set up a concession stand, and she would go get all the food, and she would sell it. And, and she just was a bright light in the middle of we had three fields going, and she just was kind of the central person, and she just exemplified Jesus on the field. We had lots of community people participating, and she was, and she was an encouragement to, even to my wife and I as we kind of were journeying through some difficult times in our own life, and, and she just was smiling, and, and then about halfway through the season, she's, she's not there, and so I just asked the director, you know, we have this uh, girl I was working with that sort of managed the, the soccer league, and she's like, well, she's, she's sick. And I'm like, Really? Yeah, like she was actually been in remission for several, uh, for a season here, but uh, it's come back. She's got cancer. It's a tumor. And, um, and she's, you know, kind of vulnerable right now, like many people in our current world. And it just kind of shocked me. Because in the midst of her journey, I mean, she had every reason to be self-focused, but she was there to give for others. She was there to serve others and to bring joy to others, even in my own life. And my circumstances, as difficult as they were, seemed really small in, in the fact that here's this young mom with young kids and, and just a heart for Jesus and a love for people, and she's got this uh, situation going on. We prayed for her, we prayed for her, we prayed for her. And in the end, she passed away. And I have no answers for you. Why did God allow that to happen? I don't know. He allows us to go through many different journeys in life, and I, I can't explain to you why some, some people get healed, some people don't. I, I, I have no answer except that God does it for his ultimate glory. 
And he allows us in this time right now of COVID-19 to, to, to go through this time where we've got our kids at home, where we're working from home, where some of you are unemployed, and, and I don't know what he's doing, but his, his goal in our lives is that he would receive glory and that we would draw closer to him even through it. So keep drawing near to God even in the midst of your circumstance. He took on the most difficult situation that life offers us, death, and he handled it with no problem. He can handle your situation. You can trust in him today. If you want to believe in Jesus Christ, you can just do it right where you're sitting, in your room, in your office, looking on your phone. It's a heartfelt prayer to God where you receive him, where you, I believe in you, Jesus. And what the promise is is that you will receive this life that he promises. And while that might not take away the social distancing, <laughs> you may not get your job back tomorrow, It may not fill up your bank account. I understand the problems and the situations may not go away, but you'll have someone to journey with you through it in a way that you and I both need. God's presence with us and a promise for eternal life. I was reading this article, and this is a quote that was in the American Scholar. It's a secular article. The article was The Anxiety of Culpability. Philip Alcebi says this, It's so hard to keep in mind that the human problem always isn't how to avoid death, it's how to live. It's so hard to keep in mind that the human problem always isn't how to avoid death, it's how to live. And he's writing this article about COVID-19 and all this stuff, but he's like, the, the human problem, but Jesus comes, he says, I am the solution to that problem. Life is found in me. I'm telling you, I don't know that anyone else is offering you anything better. There is nothing better. No one can help you like Jesus can in this situation. Christians, non-Christians, we all need Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's what you need to start today. And for believers here today, we need to just get back to Jesus, circle back to Jesus. He wants to be glorified in this situation in your life. Trust him. Hold on to him. Cling to him. Believe in him and grow with him as we journey together. God will look after you. It may not be the way you think. It may not be as fast as you want it to happen. It may involve a different journey and destination than you expected. But he promises to look after you and to be the life for you and for me as we journey through this. I hope and pray that you'll find God's guidance in this situation in your life as we journey together. Let me close in prayer and you can go on as a family with, with your own personal worship. And, and let, me, let me pray. Father in heaven, I pray for the person that's watching this video that doesn't know you as their Savior, that today that they would believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for their sins and rose again. And they would experience the resurrection of life in a relationship with God forever and ever. And Lord, I pray that you would give us as a church here in Lloyd Mintz the opportunity to roll away some stones so that people can hear the voice of Jesus calling out to them to come and find life. That there are those that are locked up in their houses that are looking for life in the wrong places. Help them to discover Jesus Christ. Give us opportunities to share him. And Lord, be glorified in us and through us in the peace and the hope that you give us through this circumstance and situation. Thank you for guiding us day by day. We give you the glory now. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great and godly day.